let me be one of the first to say Happy New Year to you. Can you believe it? 2023 is almost gone. What? Uh, almost a little over 12 hours from now, it will be 2024. Um, and it wouldn't be a good New Year's message when we're talking about, you know, taking a new direction, when we're talking about uh, fresh starts, if I didn't talk a little bit about New Year's resolutions. So I did a quick survey on the internet and discovered that, um, surprise, surprise, most of the resolutions that are being made by people this year, today, as we head into 2024, have to do with their physical well-being, right? I want to eat better. I'm going to have a better diet. I'm going to exercise more. I want to be more physically active. I'm going to, I'm going to take just better general health of myself, And then following up to that was um, better uh, handling of my finances and better emotional and mental health. But there was one survey that had one statistic that kind of blew me away. This one survey I looked at said that only 20%, well, let me back up. How many here will make a New Year's resolution today? Oh, come on, you guys are lying. Really? Thank you. You're, you're really, you're messing up my message here. <laughs> but those of us who do, only 20% of us will hold ourselves accountable to keeping those resolutions. I mean, we make them going in knowing we're not going to keep them. 80% of us know up front we're not, we don't have the, the willpower, we don't have the stamina, we don't have the strength to hold ourselves accountable to keeping these resolutions, to keeping these goals that we ourselves are making. There's, there's something wrong with that picture. But what may be the reason why many of you did not raise your hands is because you know we have a God who is loyal and true and who probably has a better path for us this year than anything that we can come up with. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that resolutions are bad. I, 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 I'm running a 5K tomorrow because I want to get back on the track of better health and maybe losing a few of those Christmas cookies that are around my waist. Um, I'm not saying it's bad, but what I'm saying is we can't put our faith in that. We can't hold on to those resolutions and expect to come out really any better than what we're leaving 2023 behind. We have a God who is loyal and true. We have a God who came once, and He said He's coming again, so we can put our hope in that. We can trust. His promises are yes and amen. We know that. And because we can have that hope in Him, we can experience joy when we acknowledge who He is, when we write a new song. We can can have peace, that shalom that comes over us when we praise Him from deep within our soul. And we can learn how to love because He loves us first. And so today, I want to dive in to Matthew chapter 2, because I think Matthew's going to carry on the, that, that, that story today that if we seek him, if we listen for him, and if we step out in faith, then he has a better direction for us than we can ever imagine or come up with, an our, with our own, on our own. Sorry about that. And I'm going to do something we haven't done in a long, long time. I'm going to actually read the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to be reading from the um, NIV translation, so if you want to follow along, you are welcome to. But maybe you just want to sit there, even close your eyes, if you promise not to fall asleep, and let the Word of God soak into you and see how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. So Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the uh, least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
And the prophet that Matthew is referring to there is the prophet Micah. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down. And worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. This time Matthew's referring to the prophet Hosea. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother And went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Excuse me. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. There is a lot going on in this passage of Scripture. There's all these dreams and, and magi. And I, I tell you what, when I was preparing for this message this morning, and I started really digging in to Matthew 2, it raised a whole bunch of questions. And those questions I wanted answers to got in the way of me really hearing from God what He was trying to say to me And hopefully what he is trying to say to you today through Matthew 2. So I wanted to read the entire chapter so we're all hear the whole thing because I think it it gives us a foundation and we're all on the same page. But I really want to address some of those questions that um, got in my way because I don't want them to get in your way as well, all right? So going right back into verse 1, Matthew says this, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. After Jesus was born, when did the Magi get there? We don't know. We really don't know. I will tell you this, and some of you who know me know this frustrates me about every nativity scene in everyone's house. The Magi were not at the Jesus' birth. Actually, ours on our fireplace mantle, the, the wise men are way far away from the nativity because they were on their way. They were journeying, okay? Okay. Wow, side story that has nothing to do with the message. But anyway, they weren't there. But we don't really know when they got there. But we can zero in maybe a little bit because I think what Herod was trying to do when he asked the Magi when the star first appeared, he was trying to figure out how old this this new king of the Jews is. So best guesses are that Jesus was somewhere between six months old and 18 months old. That's all I can tell you. We really don't know. He may have even been younger. He may have been a little older. We really don't know. But that's my best guess. And then the question begs, who are these magi and where in the east did they come from? We don't know. I can tell you who the magi weren't. One, they weren't kings, even though the song says they were. And two, there were probably more than three of them. 
even though the song says there were three. They probably traveled with a whole caravan of people because that's how people traveled back then. They traveled in caravans to protect themselves and to, and to uh, fend for themselves, to, to supply enough manpower in order to make sure they traveled, they made this journey. Who they were was we do know, and this is from historical documents, also a little bit maybe from uh, the prophet Daniel, but we do know that uh, they were astrologers and astronomers. They loved looking up at the skies and watching how the stars moved across the so- sky from season to season, from day to day. They watched how the planets rose and how they set. They also were probably somewhat of a philosopher's and even interpreted dreams. And we do know that probably from the prophet Daniel, because Daniel became, while, while the nation of Israel was exiled in Babylon, Daniel became chief of the Magi, and Daniel was very good. He was called upon time and time again to interpret dreams of the king of Babylon. And that leads us to where they came from. Now, they came from the east, which is somewhere east of Jerusalem. So they probably came from Babylon or possibly from Persia. Babylon is modern-day Iraq, roughly. Uh, Persia would be modern-day Iran. Needless to say, they traveled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles to get to Jerusalem. All right, that's who they were. But why did they go to Jerusalem when Jesus was in Bethlehem? Well, I think we can see that in the next verse, in verse 2. The Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. If he was king, a king would be in Jerusalem. So they went, they had been following that star that arose Maybe when he was born. We don't even know for sure when it rose. But um, um, they went to Jerusalem because that's where a king would be. All right? And then that star. This is probably one of the biggest questions of all besides where did they come from? What was that star? Guess what? We don't know. Many believe that... It was the confluence, or I think that's the word. Anyway, Saturn and Jupiter, the two planets, got really close together because they're bright anyway in the sky, and it was really ultra bright. But that's just a guess. We don't know. That guess kind of makes sense. Actually, if you go outside tonight around 8.30... Nine o'clock, look in the southern to southeastern sky. You'll probably, if it's not cloudy out, you will probably see Jupiter. It appears as a star, but, and it's the brightest thing you'll see in that direction. And it's the planet Jupiter. Not too high off the horizon, by the way. I went out and looked a couple nights ago so I could say that. Um, but we don't know. But here's where I landed with this. And, and it makes sense, but we truly don't know what that star was. I believe that God divinely placed something in the sky. And here's why. You see, I believe that he needed to have these men from somewhere east make the journey and find the newborn king. Not so newborn. He was a toddler or an infant by now. You see, I think he met those magi, those people who didn't even know who the king or who the God of Israel is. They didn't worship him. They may have heard some prophecies about that a Messiah was to be born. But I think he met them where they were because they were astrologers. They watched for the movement of the stars. They watched for something to come up. And when when that divinely appointed star, and maybe that was fire in the sky they knew something was different they knew that what had been promised had happened and they knew they had to make that journey to Jerusalem or to Israel to worship this king of the Jews why do I think that? because God did it before anyone remember the story of when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt they landed at Mount Sinai God appeared to them in fire on top of the mountain. And then how did he guide them through the wilderness? Of course, they didn't know, but God knew they were going to be wandering around for 40 years. Yeah, 
column of fire and a pillar of smoke. And what happened? That column of fire moved and then would stop when he wanted the the nation of Israel to stop. And that's where they'd set up camp. You see, he's done it before. I believe that was divinely placed by God in order to achieve the purposes that he had for these magi. So now that we've got those questions out of the way, can we see what God has to say to us today? But I think it's important that we're all thinking the same thing. At least you know where my mind is. Even if you have a different uh, viewpoint on what those things are, who those people were, where they came from, at least you know where my mind is and where I'm coming from today. So let's go on. Oh, let me ask you this question though. If there are so many questions that technically go unanswered, why did Matthew include this account in his gospel? He's the only gospel writer who talked about magi coming from the east. He's the only gospel writer who talked about uh, Joseph and Mary and the, and the infant Jesus going to Egypt and then coming back and then going back home to Galilee. Why did he include that? Well, if you were with us last week on Christmas Eve, um, you heard Pastor Tim say this. He said, Christmas is an opportunity to be reminded that God loved us enough to chart a course that leads us back to him. You see, God wants you, and he has from the very beginning, from the very time that, that Adam and Eve had to be lifted up out of the garden by God and placed outside the garden in exile to the east, by the way, He's wanted to restore that relationship. You see, when he picked up Adam and Eve out of the garden and placed them in the east, that separated all of humanity from then until today away from God. And he's been charting that course to get back to him. And Matthew's audience were Jewish people. He was writing to Jewish people. So I believe that he spent his entire gospel trying to show the Jewish people that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those prophecies that they would have known about. I mean, he referred to four different prophecies in one chapter. Micah, Hosea, Jeremiah, and then an unnamed prophet that said he would be called a Nazarene. So I think what he's trying to show the people then when he wrote it, and what I think he's trying to show us today is that Jesus is in fact that course that leads us back to God when we put our faith in him, when we seek him, with everything we've got, and when we listen for him, and then step out in faith in response to him. So let's dig in and see where that lands us. Verse 3, Matthew continues, when King Herod heard this, when he heard that the Magi were asking, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. I get why Herod was disturbed. Can you? I mean, if there was a new king of the Jews, I'd be a little upset if I was the king of Israel. I mean, I can I can imagine what's going through Herod's mind. Hey, Rome put me here. I'm king. There isn't some newborn king who's going to take my place. That that would have that would have riled him up a little bit. I think he'd have been a little upset, a little disturbed. But what gets me about this is why was all of Jerusalem disturbed? It's possible that Matthew is referring to the the chief priests and the teachers of the law that he then goes on to talk about in verse 4 or 5. It's possible because biblical writers tended to do that from time to time. They would use a very generic term to talk about a very specific group. I believe that he was talking about all of Jerusalem. All the people, all the Jewish people were disturbed that this king of the Jews had been born. Well, Pastor Mark, why would, why would they be disturbed? I mean, haven't they been waiting for the Messiah? Wouldn't they have heard all the hubbub from the birth from 6 to 12 to 18 months prior? I mean, the shepherds, if we go and read the account of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, we know that the, that the shepherds were there the night he was born. And then they left there and they told everyone about what they had seen and what they had heard. And certainly Bethlehem was only about seven miles from J- Jerusalem. Certainly that news would have gotten back. And, and they presented Jesus at the temple and you know all the, the things that were going on. They would have heard. Wouldn't they have been excited about that? Wouldn't they have wanted to see that and be part of that? Well, they were looking for a Messiah right? They thought God was sending a Messiah 
not to save them from their sins. He thought they were sending a Messiah to save them from Rome and the Roman Empire and the oppression they were sensing and experiencing. So when the Magi came and said, hey, where's this one being uh, that was born king of the Jews? I don't think they were looking for a king. And I think it stirred them up a little bit. I think they're going, hey, you know what? I know Herod, Herod's part of the Roman Empire, but he actually treats us pretty well. He kind of leaves us alone and lets us do our own thing. Criminy, he even added on to our temple. Herod was a builder. He loved building buildings. And he added on to the temple. The economy was humming. And like I said, he kind of just left them alone. Well, things are going pretty good over here. I don't want a new king who might stir things up. I, I don't think I like that. So my question for you is, is, do you get all stirred up when you think about Jesus being king of your life? You know, sometimes we get so caught up in worrying about what could happen that we miss what's right in front of our face. We get all stirred up thinking, you know what, I, I kind of like being in control of my own life, and that's the truth. I kind of like being in control. I don't need a king. I don't really want a king that's going to guide me, that's going to show me where to go. What about you? Are you troubled or are you celebrating that Jesus is king of your life? Are you, are you disturbed? Are you worried? Are you think, oh no, what's he going to ask me to do? Or are you going, woohoo, here's the Messiah. He's got a plan for me and I'm going to step into that plan and we're going to do great things together. And therefore, I'm going to celebrate that and I'm going to worship him. Or do you go, hmm, no thank you. Are you disturbed or are you troubled that Jesus is your king? And you know what? If you don't know him as your king, if you don't know him as your Lord, as your Messiah, you can make that decision today. You can say, you know what? Lord, I'm tired of doing this all on my own. I'm trying to make resolutions that I can't keep that I won't keep. I need some help. I want some help. I need a Lord and I need a king of my life. You can make that decision today. The only thing I ask is just one thing, is if you do, tell someone after service that you made that decision today. Not so because we're nosy. I would invite you to tell one of the pastors or someone you came with, but it's because, so we can journey alongside you as you start this new life with Jesus as your guide. All right? So what happens next? I'm going to summarize verses 4 through 8 because we've already read it. He meets with the chief priests in the temple, uh, the teachers of the law, to find out where the Messiah was to, be, was to be born. He has that conversation with the Magi. It says, hey, when did that star first appear? And when did you see it? And when did you leave? I mean, he's asking all those questions. We get a few words, but you know that there was this whole conversation going on. And then he says, hey, you go on ahead you go ahead and worship him, and then you come back and tell me where he is because I want to worship him too. Well, here's a man who was threatened by this new king. You think he really wanted to worship him? I, I really don't. And then we carry on in verses 9 and 10. After they heard this, after the Magi heard the king talking about Herod, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I just think about Bethlehem and I'm thinking about, you mean the, the Magi needed a star to get them seven miles to Bethlehem? I mean, Bethlehem was a dinky little village. I'm not going to pick on any villages. I did that in the first uh, service, and it, and it came back to bite me. Um, so, um, but think of the smallest village you know in Shelby County or in Miami County, wherever you live. And think about how it wouldn't take that long for the Magi to go house to house, find a household that had an infant boy, and then ask a few questions, see if he is, in fact, the newborn king, and worship him. But you see, God had a sense of urgency here. God had a better plan. 
You know, too often we try to do it our way. And that's why I believe the Magi were overjoyed when they saw that star because they didn't want to rest until they got to Jesus. And when that star appeared and it started moving again, just like the pillar of fire in the wilderness, you know, hear these, hear these Magi. Think about this. That, that pillar of fire guided the, the Israelites through the wilderness until they got to the promised land. This star this fire in the sky led the Magi from the east through the wilderness until they got to the promised land. God wants to lead you and guide you as well. He really, really does. And if you just seek him, just like the Magi did, he will, in fact, do that. Um, but what, so what stands out to me is that these magi, as I just said, did not give up. They didn't rest until they got to Jesus, right? They followed that star. If they, were, if they started in Babylon and Persia, they were anywhere from 500 to 1,000 miles from Jerusalem. Now, to give you a point of reference, because I couldn't figure out how far is 500 miles, that's about from Sydney to Atlanta, Georgia. I don't like getting in a car to go to Atlanta because I have to sit in a car for eight hours. Can you imagine walking through the wilderness over tough terrain or riding on camels or donkeys or horses, whatever they did? Can you imagine that? If, if, if you can, let me say this, if they came from Persia, they were about 1,000 miles away. That's like walking from here to Tampa. But you don't have a nice interstate highway to walk on. By the way, don't ever do that. That's not right, and it's not safe. Don't walk on the interstate. But imagine walking hundreds and hundreds of miles. They, I would have given up. Even though that star was there, even though that star was guiding them, they never gave up. They didn't rest they kept going. That's why they were overjoyed when the star showed up again because they're going, yes, I'm on the right track. I'm going to get to my end goal. And my end goal is to see Jesus. They may not have known that that was his name, but they knew he was special. And they knew that God was calling them to worship him. Other things that showed that they wouldn't rest until they saw him. You know what? They really didn't listen to King Herod, did they? I mean, King Herod said, hey, you go do that and then come back and then I'll, uh, I'll worship them too. No, they didn't really listen to them. They listened to God when God spoke to them in a dream and said, hey, go a different way back to your country. They did that. And then there were those gifts. Back in verse 11, it says, they opened their treasures and gave him gifts of gold frankincense, and myrrh. That word gift there is, in Greek is D-O-R-O-N. I believe it's pronounced doron or doron. That word does mean gift, but it also means offering or sacrifice. You see, these magi, these men from the east who didn't know the God of Israel sacrificed everything they had and didn't rest until they got to Jesus. They sacrificed the comfort and their wealth of their home to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles, maybe up to a thousand miles on foot to get to Jesus. They followed this fire in the sky that they understood, but you know, there comes a point where you have to go, really God? Well, they wouldn't have said that. They would have just said, really? We're following a star? And then they sacrificed their own wealth in the terms of the gifts that they gave Jesus. What are you willing to sacrifice? To not rest until you find Jesus. And I bet you many of you right now are saying, well, Pastor Mark, I, I found Jesus many, many years ago. I did too. 25 years ago, almost 26. I, I said yes to Jesus' invitation to follow him. And allow him to be Lord of my life. Was I always successful at that? Uh-uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But, um, 
But what I'm talking about is do you seek him with everything you've got? Do you not rest to find him and to hear from him every day of your life? We've talked about it millions of times in this room. Following Jesus is not about Sunday morning. It's about following him and seeking him every day of your life. What are you willing to sacrifice, to seek Jesus, to not rest until you see him and hear from him? For me, it's always been comfort and control. I already mentioned it. I kind of like to be in control. I used to call myself a control freak. And you can ask the rest of the staff, I still tend to be that way from time to time. But what are you willing to sacrifice to seek Jesus day after day after day? Because when you do, he will speak to you. Just like he spoke to the Magi in that dream, when they were seeking him, he will speak to you as well. And he will tell you what path you, he wants you to take. And it will be a much better path than you can even imagine. And that we talk about that, or we read about that in verse 12 when, he, when Matthew says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When we seek Jesus with all that we've got, when we don't rest until we find him, he will often tell us to take a different route. He will say, hey, you know what? I know you were comfortable. I know you were going this direction, but really I need you to go this direction. Not only did he do it with the Magi, but he did it with Joseph. Joseph. Time and time and time again, three times, he gave Joseph a dream where an angel spoke to him and said, hey, I know you're settled in on Bethlehem now. You know, Bethlehem was his hometown. It's one of those other questions we really don't know the answer to is, why were they still in Bethlehem? We know they came from Nazareth, right? Why were they still in Bethlehem? Well, G Joseph's family was there. That's just a hypothesis. You know, maybe they were just settling in. Maybe they were just hanging out because maybe they didn't have the means to get back to Nazareth. They were dirt poor. So he tells Jesus um, in a dream, hey, get up, leave. I know you're settled. I know you're comfortable, but get up and go to Egypt. Can you imagine what was going to, through Joseph's mind? I mean, remember, he had already heard from God through a dream when he said, hey, it's okay that Mary's pregnant. You're gonna have a son and you're gonna name him Jesus. But can you imagine? Oh my goodness, we, six months ago, we traveled from Nazareth to here. Mary was nine months pregnant. That was not easy. Now you want me to take another journey to Egypt with an infant? But he did. And then he tells him in another dream, okay, coast is clear, come back. Oh, really, God? You want me to get up again? Now maybe Jesus, maybe we, he was walking a little bit. Maybe it'd be a little easier because he'd walk part of the way. Um, you want me to take another trip? You see, when we seek Jesus with all we've got, when we seek God, when we're following him and listening to him and we hear what he's speaking to us, he often tells us to take a different route. And do you see what's, what's really happening here? God is showing just how loyal and true he really is. He loves us enough to chart that course to bring us back to him. And nothing is going to get in his way. Nothing is going to stop him. I talked about how the Magi didn't rest until they found Jesus. But I'm telling you, they didn't rest because nothing got in the way of God's plan. Nothing got in the way of God's plan to draw you back to him. And every time he tells you to take a different route, every time as we go into a new year, he's saying, hey, I know you were doing this. I need you to do this now. He's doing that because his plan is perfect and nothing will get in the way of that. And he wants you more than anything else. He wants to be in relationship with you. So nothing will get in his way. That star that he, I believe he placed in the sky Provided guidance for the Magi, not once, but twice. In verse 11, going back to verse 11, we talk about those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We often get hung up on the fact that, that um, gold is gift for a king and Jesus is our king, right? We've talked about that. Um, frankincense is the, 
is the uh, incense that the high priests burn in the temple as a prayer offering to God. And Jesus is our high priest. He intercedes on our behalf with God the Father. And then the myrrh. The myrrh is, 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 a, is a perfume. It's a very strong perfume that was used as a burial perfume because when a body started decomposing, it would stink. And so they would put myrrh on people who, uh, who had died to, 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 um, to hide that, that odor. And many believe that that gift foreshadows the fact that Jesus was going to be sacrificed once and for all for our sinful nature because that's our course that gets us back to God because there had to be a sacrifice for our sinful nature. But what I think the gifts were for, I think the gifts were so Mary and Joseph had a way to get to Egypt. They were literally dirt poor. We don't know. Maybe Joseph had, had reestablished his carpentry business in Bethlehem since they seemed to have settled there a little bit, but he left his business behind. Mary was a teenager. They had nothing. And so when God wakes you up in a dream and says, hey, get up and go to Egypt, the first thing I would have thought of was, uh, how are we going to do that? And how am I going to live once we get there? Because Egypt isn't Bethlehem. It's going to cost something to live there. And to stay there until this angel comes back and tells me to go home. You see, nothing gets in the way of God's plan. Then God gave the Magi that dream to go a different route. And think about this for a minute. God knew that Herod was going to kill the babies, right? Or the infant boys. He told Joseph that in the dream. He knew that. But if, if the Magi had gone directly back to Herod like Herod had asked... There wouldn't have been time for Jesus and Joseph and Mary to escape to Egypt. So by the fact that he gave them a dream to go a different route and they listened and did it, it gave time for them, for the Holy Family, to escape and go on their way to Egypt. Nothing gets in the way of God's plan. And then finally, God gave Joseph and Mary and Jesus those different routes as well. As I was thinking about that, I thought, if Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice, why didn't he just let Herod sacrifice him as a child? I mean, wouldn't it, could it have been the same thing? But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that Jesus would grow up and he would reveal himself to the people. And he would call others to him. We call them disciples. Now we call them the apostles. Who would then go out and spread the gospel. Spread the good news of Jesus. And that would happen generation after generation after generation. And today on December 31st, 2023. As we're about to look forward into 2024 in Sydney, Ohio. We can still share the gospel. Yeah. God's plan, nothing gets in the way of God's plan. He wants you back with him. And Jesus is the way. And nothing's going to get in the way of that plan. But you know what? It's not all on God. Uh, Pastor Tim talked about it earlier, and I've mentioned it a couple times. We all can make decisions on our own, right? Right? And we have a role in God's plan as well. And that role is obedience. Ooh, I don't like to obey. I don't like that word. Obey means I'm submitting to someone else. Obey, you know, as a kid, I go, I don't, I don't have to listen to you, Mom. Because we don't like to obey. But when you think about it, obedience to God is simply hearing what he has to say to you. And acting accordingly. The Magi did it. They heard in a dream to take a different route. Did they go back to Herod? No. They stepped out in obedience and went a different route. Joseph, when Joseph had that dream, the angel of the Lord said, get up. That literally means wake up. He woke up. We read it in, I don't know, I think it's verse 14. We literally read, he got up. He woke up, he got Joseph and Mary, and that night... 
he left for Egypt. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him again in Egypt, he got up again and went back to Israel. And then he was obedient. We read, sorry, Sarah Jean, I don't remember what verse it is. Um, It is verse 22 and 23. He withdrew to the region of Galilee. He once again was obedient. You see, you and I have a role in God's plan today, and that is being obedient. So my question for you today is, are you willing to take a different route? Are you willing to step out in faith and be obedient when you hear from God? And the way you hear from God can go many, many ways. You may hear him in your spirit. You may hear from him in a dream, just like the Magi and Joseph did time and time and time again. You may hear from him as you read his word and study his word. You may hear from him through a, uh, a uh, brother or sister in Christ who's sharing, hey, you know what? I'm seeing this in your life. I think maybe you should go this direction instead of the direction you were going in. But what is your new route Is it doing something hard? Is it doing something unexpected? Is it maybe giving up a habit or an addiction that you have and God is saying, hey, you know what? I know you're comfortable doing this, but really, my plan is to draw yourself back, is to draw you back to me. I really need you to go this route. For me, my route, um, I've been on this route for probably 23 or 24 years. Shortly after I said yes to Jesus, I came across in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 30, um, and it became my life verse. Uh, I now have hundreds and hundreds of life verses, but early in my walk with Jesus, I didn't know any better, so that became my life verse. But I became my life verse, and I'll share it with you in a moment, um, because I knew I needed to hang on to it. And that verse is John the Baptist, and he's telling other people about Jesus. And he says this, he says, he, meaning Jesus, must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. You see, I have an ego problem. I like it, <laughs> this, is, this is really ironic, um, I like it when the spotlight is on me. There are two spotlights up in the corner shining down on me right now. I like it. I like to be the center of attention. But I've been on this new direction. I've been on this new route for 23 years. But really, and sometimes I'm obedient, sometimes I step out in faith, and sometimes I wouldn't. But if truth be told, over the last probably five or six years, God has really been saying, Mark, listen, I need you on this new route. And I'm becoming more excuse me, more and more obedient to what he is saying to me. And sometimes I'll, I'll want to say something and God will go, nope, you don't need to say that because that's drawing attention to you. Or I'll want to do something, he goes, nope, 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 shine the light on me, not on yourself. He'll say that over and over and over again. I've been stepping out in obedience and being able to do that. What's your new route that God is calling you too. And are you willing to take it? I'm going to invite the worship team back up as we wrap up. And as we look forward in probably about 12 hours now to ringing in 2024, my question for you is, are you going to take control of your own life? Or are you going to let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords be King of of your life? Are you going to make resolutions that most of us know we're not going to keep anyway? Are you going to set your own path that you know you can't keep anyway? Are you going to try to go your own way and take control when you know you can't do it anyway? Or are you going to surrender it all, just like the Magi did, and not give up until you found him and listen to him to see what new route he wants you on in 2024? Nothing gets in the way of God's plan. We try. I do a pretty darn good job of it sometimes. But ultimately, nothing gets in the way of God's plan. 
So my bottom line for you as we go into 2024 is this. Jesus will change your life. When you take a role, when you are obedient, when you don't rest until you see him day after day after day, when you seek him with all you've got and you hear from him to take a different route.